Section 22 of Part 3 of Religious Affections. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Matthew James Gray, mjgray.id.au. Religious Affections by Jonathan Edwards. Section 22 of Part 3. Secondly, I proceed to show that Christian practice, taken in the sense that has been explained, is the chief of all the evidences of a saving sincerity in religion to the consciences of the professors of it, much to be preferred to the method of the first convictions, enlightenings, and comforts in conversion, or any imminent discoveries or exercises of grace whatsoever that begin and end in contemplation. The evidence of this appears by the following arguments. Argument 1. Reason plainly shows that those things which put it to the proof what men will actually cleave to and prefer in their practice, when left to follow their own choice and inclinations, are the proper trial what they do really prefer in their hearts. Sincerity in religion, as has been observed already, consists in setting God highest in the heart, in choosing him before other things, in having a heart to sell all for Christ, etc. But a man's actions are the proper trial what a man's heart prefers. As, for instance, when it is so that God and other things come to stand in competition, God is, as it were, set before a man on one hand, and his worldly interest or pleasure on the other as it often is so in the course of a man's life. His behaviour in such case is actually cleaving to the one and forsaking the other, is the proper trial which he prefers. Sincerity consists in forsaking all for Christ in heart, but to forsake all for Christ in heart is the very same thing as to have a heart to forsake all for Christ. But certainly the proper trial whether a man has a heart to forsake all for Christ is his being actually put to it, the having Christ and other things coming in competition that he must actually or practically cleave to one and forsake the other. To forsake all for Christ in heart is the same thing as to have a heart to forsake all for Christ when called to it. But the highest proof to ourselves and others that we have a heart to forsake all for Christ when called to it is actually doing it when called to it, or so far as called to it. To follow Christ in heart is to have a heart to follow him. To deny ourselves in heart for Christ is the same thing as to have a heart to deny ourselves for him in fact. The main and most proper proof of a man's having a heart to anything concerning which he is at liberty to follow his own inclinations, and either to do, or not to do as he pleases, is his doing of it. When a man is at liberty whether to speak or keep silence, the most proper evidence of his having a heart to speak is his speaking. When a man is at liberty whether to walk or sit still, the proper proof of his having a heart to walk is his walking. Godliness consists not in a heart to intend to do the will of God, but in a heart to do it. The children of Israel in the wilderness had the former, of whom we read, Deuteronomy chapter 5, verses 27, 28, 29, Go thou near, and hear all that the Lord our God shall say, and speak thou unto us all that the Lord our God shall speak unto thee, and we will hear it and do it. And the Lord heard the voice of your words, when ye spake unto me. And the Lord said to me, I have heard the voice of the words of this people, which they have spoken unto thee. They have well said all that they have spoken. Oh, that there were such a heart in them, that they would fear me, and keep all my commandments always, that it might be well with them, and with their children for ever. The people manifested that they had a heart to intend to keep God's commandments, and to be very forward in those intentions. But God manifests that this was far from being the thing that he desired, wherein true godliness consists, even a heart, actually to keep them. 
it is therefore exceedingly absurd and even ridiculous for any to pretend that they have a good heart while they live a wicked life or do not bring forth the fruit of universal holiness in their practice for it is proved in fact that such men do not love god above all it is foolish to dispute against plain fact and experience men that live in ways of sin and yet flatter themselves that they shall go to heaven or expect to be received hereafter as holy persons without a holy practice act as though they expected to make a fool of their judge which is implied in what the apostle says speaking of men's doing good works and living a holy life thereby exhibiting evidence of their title to everlasting life galatians chapter 6 verse 7 be not deceived god is not mocked for whatsoever a man soweth that shall he also reap as much as to say do not deceive yourselves with an expectation of reaping life everlasting hereafter if you do not sow to the spirit here it is in vain to think that god will be made a fool of by you shammed and baffled with shadows instead of substances and with vain pretense instead of that good fruit which he expects when the contrary to what you pretend appears plainly in your life before his face in this manner the word mock is sometimes used in scripture thus delilah says to samson behold thou hast mocked me and told me lies judges chapter 16 verses 10 and 13 i e thou hast baffled me as though you would have made a fool of me as if i might be easily turned off with any vain pretense instead of the truth so it is said that lot when he told his sons-in-law that god would destroy that place he seemed as one that mocked to his sons-in-law genesis chapter 19 verse 14 i e he seemed as one that would make a game of them as though they were such credulous fools as to regard such bugbears but the great judge whose eyes are as a flame of fire will not be mocked or baffled with any pretenses without a holy life if in his name men have prophesied and wrought miracles and have had faith so that they could remove mountains and cast out devils and however high their religious affections have been however great resemblances they have had of grace and though their hiding place has been so dark and deep that no human skill nor search could find them out yet if they are workers or practices of iniquity they cannot hide their hypocrisy from their judge job chapter thirty four verse twenty two there is no darkness nor shadow of death where the workers of iniquity may hide themselves would a wise prince suffer himself to be fooled and baffled by a subject who should pretend that he was a loyal subject and should tell his prince that he had an entire affection to him and that at such and such a time he had experience of it and felt his affections strongly working towards him and should come expecting to be accepted and rewarded by his prince as one of his best friends on that account though he lived in rebellion against him following some pretender to his crown and from time to time stirring up sedition against him or would a master suffer himself to be shammed and gulled by a servant that should pretend to great experiences of love and honour towards him in his heart and a great sense of his worthiness and kindness to him when at the same time he refused to obey him and he could get no service done by him argument two as reason shows that those things which occur in the course of life that put it to the proof whether men will prefer god to other things in practice are the proper trial of the uprightness and sincerity of their hearts so the same are represented as the proper trial of the sincerity of professors in the scripture there we find that such things are called by that very name trials or temptations which i before observed are, are both words of the same signification the things that put it to the proof whether men will prefer god to other things in practice are the difficulties of religion or those things which occur that make the practice of duty difficult and cross to other principles beside the love of god because in them god and other things are both set before men together for their actual and practical choice and it comes to this that we cannot hold to both but one or the other must be forsaken
and these things are all over the scripture called by the name of trials or proofs and they are called by this name because hereby professors are tried and proved of what sort they be whether they be really what they profess and appear to be and because in them the reality of a supreme love to god is brought to the test of experiment and fact they are the proper proofs in which it is truly determined by experience whether men have a thorough disposition of heart to cleave to god or no deuteronomy chapter 8 verse 2 and thou shalt remember all the way which the lord thy god led thee these forty years in the wilderness to humble thee and to prove thee whether thou wouldst keep his commandments or no judges chapter 2 verses 21 and 22 i also will not henceforth drive out any from before them of the nations which joshua left when he died that through them i may prove israel whether they will keep the way of the lord so chapter 3 verses 1 and 4 and exodus chapter 16 verse 4 the scripture when it calls these difficulties of religion by the name of temptations or trials explains itself to mean thereby the trial or experiment of their faith james chapter 1 verses 2 and 3 my brethren count it all joy when ye fall into diverse temptations knowing this that the trying of your faith worketh patience 1 peter chapter 1 verses 6 and 7 now for a season ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold etc so the apostle paul speaks of that expensive duty of parting with our substance to the poor as the proof of the sincerity of the love of christians 2 corinthians chapter 8 verse 8 and the difficulties of religion are often represented in scripture as being the trial of professors in the same manner that the furnace is the proper trial of gold and silver psalm 66 verses 10 and 11 thou o god hast proved us thou hast tried us as silver is tried thou broughtest us into the net thou laidest affliction upon our loins zechariah chapter 13 verse 9 and i will bring the third part of them through the fire and i will refine them as silver is refined and i will try them as gold is tried that which has the color and appearance of gold is put into the furnace to try whether it be what it seems to be real gold or no so the difficulties of religion are called trials because they try those that have the profession and appearance of saints whether they are what they appear to be real saints if we put true gold into the furnace we shall find its great value and preciousness so the truth and inestimable value of the virtues of a true christian appear when under these trials 1 peter chapter 1 verse 7 that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth might be found unto praise and honor and glory true and pure gold will come out of the furnace in full weight so true saints when tried come forth as gold job chapter 23 verse 10 christ distinguishes true grace from counterfeit by this that it is gold tried in the fire revelation chapter 3 verses 17 and 18 so that it is evident that these things are called trials in scripture principally as they try or prove the sincerity of professors and from what has now been observed it is evident that they are the most proper trial or proof of their sincerity inasmuch as the very meaning of the word trial as it is ordinarily used in scripture is the difficulty occurring in the way of a professor's duty as the trial or experiment of his sincerity if trial of sincerity be the proper name of these difficulties of religion then doubtless these difficulties of religion are properly and eminently the trial of sincerity for they are doubtless eminently what they are called by the holy ghost god gives things their name from that which is eminently their nature and if it be so that these things are the proper and eminent trial proof or experiment of the sincerity of professors then certainly the result of the trial or experiment that is persons behavior or practice under such trials 
is the proper and eminent evidence of their sincerity, for they are called trials or proofs only with regard to the result, and because the effect is eminently the proof or evidence. And this is the most proper proof and evidence to the conscience of those that are the subjects of these trials. For when God is said by these things to try men and prove them, to see what is in their hearts, and whether they will keep his commandments or no, we are not to understand that it is for his own information, or that he may obtain evidence himself of their sincerity, for he needs no trials for his information, but chiefly for their conviction, and to exhibit evidence to their consciences. Thus, when God is said to prove Israel by the difficulties they met with in the wilderness, and by the difficulties they met with from their enemies in Canaan, to know what was in their hearts, whether they would keep his commandments or no, it must be understood that it was to discover them to themselves, that they might know what was in their own hearts. So when God tempted or tried Abraham with that difficult command of offering up his son, it was not for his satisfaction, whether he feared God or no, but for Abraham's own greater satisfaction and comfort, and the more clear manifestation of the favour of God to him. When Abraham had proved faithful under his trial, God says to him, Now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me, which plainly implies that in this practical exercise of Abraham's grace under this trial was a clearer evidence of the truth of his grace than ever was before and the greatest evidence to Abraham's conscience, because God himself gives it to Abraham as such for his comfort and rejoicing, and speaks of it to him as what might be the greatest evidence to his conscience of his being upright in the sight of his judge. Which proves what I say, that holy practice under trials is the highest evidence of the sincerity of professors to their own consciences, and we find that Christ from time to time took the same method to convince the consciences of those that pretended friendship to him, and to show them what they were. This was the method he took with the rich young man, Matthew chapter 19, verse 16, etc. He seemed to show a great respect to Christ. He came kneeling to high, and called him good master, and made a great profession of obedience to the commandments. But Christ tried him by bidding him go and sell all that he had, and give it to the poor, and come and take up his cross and follow him, telling him that then he should have treasure in heaven. So he tried another that we read of, Matthew chapter 8, verse 20. He made a great profession of respect to Christ. Says he, Lord, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. Christ immediately puts his friendship to the proof by telling him that the foxes had holes and the birds of the air had nests, but that the Son of Man had not where to lay his head. And thus Christ is wont still to try professed disciples in general in his providence. So the seed sown in every kind of ground, stony ground, thorny ground, and good ground, which in all appears alike when it first springs up, yet is tried, and the difference made to appear by the burning heat of the sun. Seeing therefore that these are the things that God makes use of to try us, it is undoubtedly the surest way for us to pass a right judgment on ourselves, to try ourselves by the same things. These trials of his are not for his information, but for ours. Therefore we ought to receive our information from thence. The surest way to know our gold is to look upon it and examine it in God's furnace, where he tries it for that end, that we may see what it is. If we have a mind to know whether a building stands strong or no, we must look upon it when the wind blows. If we would know whether that which appears in the form of wheat has the real substance of wheat, or be only chaff, we must observe it when it is winnowed. If we would know whether a staff be strong or a rotten broken reed, we must observe it when it is leaned on and weight is borne upon it. If we would weigh ourselves justly, we must weigh ourselves in God's scales that he makes use of to weigh us. These trials, in the course of our practice, are as it were the balances in which our hearts are weighed, or in which Christ and the world, or Christ and his competitors, as to the esteem and regard they have in our hearts are weighed, or are put into opposite scales, by which there is opportunity to see which preponderates. When a man is brought to the dividing of paths, 
the one of which leads to Christ and the other to the object of his lusts, to see which way he will go or is brought, and as it were set before Christ and the world, Christ on the right hand and the world on the left, so that if he goes to one, he must leave the other, to see which his heart inclines most to, or which preponderates in his heart. This is just the same thing as laying Christ and the world in two opposite scales, and his going to the one and leaving the other is just the same thing as the sinking of one scale and the rising of the other. A man's practice, therefore, under the trials of God's providence, is as much the proper evidence of the superior inclination of his heart as the motion of the balance, with different weights in opposite scales, is the proper experiment of the superior weight. Argument 3. Another argument that holy practice, in the sense which has been explained, is the highest kind of evidence of the truth of grace to the consciences of Christians, is that in practice grace, in scripture style, is said to be made perfect or to be finished. So the Apostle James says, James chapter 2 verse 22, Seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect, or finished, as the word in the original properly signifies. So the love of God is said to be made perfect or finished in keeping his commandments. 1 John chapter 2 verses 4 and 5 He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoso keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. The commandment of Christ which the Apostle has especially respect to, when he here speaks of our keeping his commandments, is, as I observed before, that great commandment of his, which respects deeds of love to our brethren, as appears by the following verses. Again, the love of God is said to be perfected in the same sense, chapter 4, verse 12, if we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected in us. Here, doubtless, the Apostle has still respect to loving one another in the same manner that he had explained in the preceding chapter, speaking of loving one another as a sign of the love of God, verses 17 and 18. Whoso hath this world's goods, and shutteth up his bowels, etc., how dwelleth the love of God in him? My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed or in work, and in truth. By thus loving in work, the Apostle says, the love of God is perfected in us. Grace is said to be perfected, or finished, in holy practice, as therein it is brought to its proper effect, and to that exercise which is the end of the principle. The tendency and design of grace herein is reached, and its operation completed and crowned, as the degree is made perfect in the fruit, it is not perfected in the seeds being planted in the ground. As the tree is made perfect in the fruit, it is not perfected in the first quickening of the seed, and in its putting forth root and sprout, nor is it perfected when it comes up out of the ground, nor is it perfected in bringing forth leaves, nor yet in putting forth blossoms, but when it has brought forth good, ripe fruit. When it is perfected, therein it reaches its end. The design of the tree is finished. All that belongs to the tree is completed and brought to its proper effect in the fruit. So is grace in its practical exercises. Grace is said to be made perfect or finished in its work or fruit, in the same manner as it is said of sin. James chapter 1 verse 15, When lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Here are three steps. First, sin in its principle or habit, in the being of lust in the heart, and nextly, here is its conceiving, consisting in the imminent exercises of it in the mind. And lastly, here is the fruit that was conceived, actually brought forth in the wicked work and practice. And this the apostle calls the finishing or perfecting of sin. For the word in the original is the same that is translated perfected in those four mentioned places. Now certainly, if it be so, if grace be in this manner made perfect in its fruit, if these practical exercises of grace are those exercises wherein grace is brought to its proper effect and end, and the exercises wherein whatsoever belongs to its design, 
tendency and operation is completed and crowned then these exercises must be the highest evidences of grace above all other exercises certainly the proper nature and tendency of every principle must appear best and most fully in its most perfect exercises or in those exercises wherein its nature is most completely exerted and in its tendency most fully answered and crowned in its proper effect and end if we would see the proper nature of anything whatsoever and see it in its full distinction from other things let us look upon it in the finishing of it the apostle james says by works is faith made perfect and introduces this as an argument to prove that works are the chief evidence of faith whereby the sincerity of the professors of faith is justified james two and the apostle john after he had once and again told us that love was made perfect in keeping christ's commandments observes one john chapter four verse eighteen that perfect love casteth out fear meaning at least in part love made perfect in this sense agreeable to what he had said in the foregoing chapter that by loving in deed or work we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts verses eighteen and nineteen argument four another thing which makes it evident that holy practice is the principal evidence that we ought to make use of in judging both of our own and other sincerity is that this evidence is above all others insisted on in scripture a common acquaintance with the scripture together with a little attention and observation will be sufficient to show to any one that this is ten times more insisted on as a note of true piety throughout the scripture from the beginning of genesis to the end of revelations than anything else and in the new testament where christ and his apostles do expressly and of declared purpose lay down signs of true godliness this is almost wholly insisted on it may be observed that christ and his apostles do not only often say those things in their discoursing on the great doctrines of religion which do show what the nature of true godliness must be or from whence the nature and signs of it may be inferred by just consequence and often occasionally mention many things which do appertain to godliness but they do also often of set purpose give signs and marks for the trial of professors putting them upon trying themselves by the signs they give introducing what they say with such like expressions as these by this you shall know that you know god by this are manifest the children of god and the children of the devil he that hath this builds on a good foundation he that hath it not builds on the sand hereby we shall assure our hearts he is the man that loveth christ etc but i can find no place where either christ or his apostles do in this manner give signs of godliness though the places are many but where christian practice is almost the only thing insisted on indeed in many of these places love to the brethren is spoken of as a sign of godliness and as i have observed before there is no one virtuous affection or disposition so often expressly spoken of as a sign of true grace as our having love one to another but then the scriptures explain themselves to intend chiefly this love as exercised and expressed in practice or in deeds of love so does the apostle john who above all others insists on love to the brethren as a sign of godliness most expressly explain himself in that one john chapter three verse fourteen etc we know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren he that loveth not his brother abideth in death whoso hath this world's good and seeth his brother have need and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him how dwelleth the love of god in him my little children let us love not in word neither in tongue but in deed i e in deeds of love and in truth and hereby we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him so that when the scripture so much insists on our loving one another as a great sign of godliness we are not thereby to understand the imminent workings of affection which men feel one to another so much as the souls practising all the duties of the second table of the law all which the new testament tells us again and again a true love one to another comprehends romans chapter thirteen verses eight and ten galatians chapter five verse fourteen matthew chapter twenty two verses thirty nine and forty so that really 
There is no place in the New Testament where the declared design is to give signs of godliness, but that holy practice and keeping Christ's commandments is the mark chosen out from all others to be insisted on, which is an invincible argument that it is the chief of all the evidences of godliness. Unless we suppose that when Christ and his apostles on design set themselves about this business of giving signs by which professing Christians in all ages might determine their state, they did not know how to choose signs so well as we could have chosen for them. But if we make the word of Christ our rule, then undoubtedly those marks which Christ and his apostles did chiefly lay down and give to us that we might try ourselves by them, those same marks we ought especially to receive and chiefly to make use of in the trial of ourselves. And surely those things which Christ and his apostles chiefly insisted on in the rules they gave, ministers ought chiefly to insist on in the rules they give. To insist much on those things that the scripture insists little on, and to insist very little on those things on which the scripture insists much, is a dangerous thing, because it is going out of God's way, and is to judge ourselves and guide others in an unscriptural manner. God knew which way of leading and guiding souls was safest and best for them. He insisted so much on some things because he knew it to be needful that they should be insisted on, and let other things more alone as a wise God, because he knew it was not best for us so much to lay the weight of the trial there. As the Sabbath was made for man, so the Scriptures were made for man, and they are, by infinite wisdom, fitted for our use and benefit. We should, therefore, make them our guide in all things, in our thoughts of religion and of ourselves, and for us to make that great which the Scripture makes little, and that little which the Scripture makes great, tends to give us a monstrous idea of religion, and, at least indirectly and gradually, to lead us wholly away from the right rule, and from a right opinion of ourselves, and to establish delusion and hypocrisy. End of section 22 of part 3 Recording by Matthew James Gray mjgray.id.au